So hi, everybody. Again, my name is Hagai. I'm an engineering manager with Amazon AI. Um, I work with my team on uh, deep learning systems. And today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, model serving for machine learning with Apache MXNet and AWS. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about AWS Fargate, but you know, model serving can be done also on other AWS technologies. Um, and before we get started, um, I'd like to get like a good understanding of, of the audience. So I'll ask you a, a few questions so I can you know, moderate uh, my content based on that. Um, who here has ever uh, built and trained a machine learning model? Okay, awesome. <laughs> who, ha who had uh, built and trained a, a deep learning model, a neural network? Okay. So we'll uh, talk a bit about deep learning. Uh, who has ever deployed a machine learning or a deep learning model in production? Okay, fewer hands. Great. So this talk is really, uh, I think you'll enjoy this talk, because in this talk, uh, you will learn about serving machine learning models, and more specifically, deep learning, with a focus on deep learning models. Um, and I guarantee that if you pay attention to this talk, at the end of this talk, you'll be able to take a deep learning model, deploy it to production in around 15 minutes. Okay, is that fair? And if it doesn't work, come talk to me. <laughs> all right, let's get going. So first of all, just uh, going over the machine learning stack at AWS, just to give some context and orientation. At AWS, we want to offer, uh, you know, to give you guys the power to use machine learning for your applications and services. And we have a, a layered approach. Um, I start with the topmost layer. Um, those are uh, AI services uh, that you can just consume state-of-the-art models without knowing anything about the actual underlying models being used, without worrying about it. Um, and this includes services for things like vision, uh, through Amazon recognition, speech, through poly or transcribe, language translations, chatbots, and there is more coming. Um, if you go one layer below that, you uh, have access to AWS uh, machine learning platform. Um, and this includes things like Amazon SageMaker, which is a platform I think you heard about earlier today for end-to-end -end, you know, training, storing, deploying models. Uh, there's also um, DeepLens. There is the MTurk for data aggregation and labeling. Uh, all of that is part of our platform offering. Um, and one layer below that is the machine learning frameworks. Um, most of these framework, probably actually all of them, are open source. Um, but we at AWS are hard at work to make sure these frameworks work best and are super performant on AWS. So we actually go down to the source code of these frameworks and we optimize them and we benchmark them and we make sure they run very well uh, on AWS for you guys to use. Um, and what's nice about this tiered approach is that even internally, each layer uh, we expose is built on top the layer below that. So we are actually inside AWS. We are actually customers of our own uh, products in that sense. Okay? And MXNet is highlighted there because in this talk, uh, so first of all, uh, my team focuses a lot on MXNet. MXNet is an open source framework. I'll talk to you more about that, but we contribute a lot to it. Um, and in this talk, I'll talk to you about serving MXNet models, and we'll get a notion uh, about that. Okay, so we'll start with brief intro to deep learning. Uh, looks like you guys are well versed with machine learning, and I'm sure you know you you heard a lot, you read a lot about deep learning. Maybe you haven't had a chance to use it um, as that much, but we'll we'll go over that a bit. So first of all, for some background uh, and setting things in context, uh, we'll talk about where deep learning fits. So very broadly, there is AI that uh, has been a you know research field and more generally probably a philosophical you know, discussion area uh, for you know, quite some time. In the 50s, it started to get serious. And uh, I'm quoting here Turing, who is uh, maybe you know, one of the creators of the computer science field and also AI. And he changed the context of the question from can machines think, which is more of a philosophical question, to more practical engineering-driven questions, can machines do what us humans can? Right? And that's what we're trying to do with uh, AI now in, you know, in, in technology. Um, within AI, there is a field called machine learning, uh, who rose to prominent probably in the 80s and 90s, as now is, you know, is, is all the rage. Um, and I think a nice way to look at what machine learning is, 
is if you look at traditional programming, that's like the programming I learned at school, um, we, the programmers, uh, provide the rules through these programming languages and provide the data, and the traditional program just execute our rules on the data and gives us answers, right? That's the traditional programming. Machine learning kind of changes that paradigm, and uh, as the humans, we provide um, the data, we provide the answers, and together it's usually called uh, label data, and the machine learning uh, algorithm actually figures out the rules by itself. So we don't need to explicitly program rules anymore, right? And that's the big shift in paradigm that machine learning uh, gives us. Um, and uh, that's why it's so powerful, because it can actually solve very complex uh, problems without, without us, the programmers, actually specifying the actual rules. And so within, the, uh, within machine learning, there is a specific technique called deep learning. Machine learning includes lots of other techniques, like gradient boosting, decision trees, SVMs. There's a bunch of these uh, tools in that machine learning toolbox. Uh, deep learning is one of them, but it's one that has become much very prominent and proven to be super powerful, especially in solving what we call cognitive problems. So understanding images, understanding video, understanding just natural language, and understanding speech. And it's gradually outperforming all the other tools in the machine learning toolbox. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit more uh, about that. So again, continuing the introduction. Um, Deep learning is really based on what we call artificial neurons. They're inspired by the neurons you know, we have in our brain. Um, and you know, it's very, you know, it's just inspired. It's really not based on it uh, really, but just to give some um, indication. So our brains have around 100 billion neurons connected with around one quadrillion. So that's 1,000 trillion synapses. Um, and that's what powers our, a lot of our both um, uh, cognitive abilities, uh, and also uh, more than that. Um, and if you look at how this translates into artificial neurons in uh, deep learning, um, so again, this is just an inspiration because, in fact, the artificial neuron uh, in deep learning is much, much simpler. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, cool. So we have a set of inputs, right, which can be, you know, uh, pixels in an image or some kind of other vector representing our input. It, uh, every input entry goes through weights and then there is a linear combination, just a simply a dot product between the vector of the inputs and a vector of the weights uh, of that artif specific artificial neuron. Dot product gives us uh, some kind of scalar value which then goes through a, an activation function which is nonlinear and then we get a value between zero and one. That's it. It can be framed in a very simple mathematical formula, but that's pretty easy to implement, right? Uh, that's the most basic notion that powers up a neural network and deep learning. Of course, there's, there's more, but that's the, basic, that's the basic one. And if we go from the artificial neuron all, all the way, you know, take a step back to the neural network, then what we have in a neural network is really just a set of layers. Um, each layer has a, a set of uh, units, uh, which are typically artificial neurons. Uh, and every layer is interconnected to the next layer, uh, where every um, artificial neuron in, in the input is connected to every other artificial neuron in the output. And then we have many of these layers until we get to an output layer. Now, the reason deep learning is termed as deep learning is because uh, successful neural networks are those that are deep, meaning they have lots of hidden layers, right? And just to give some indication, um, one of the state-of-the-art uh, networks for uh, image, uh, for object detection or for object classification is called Resident 152. It has 152 of these layers, right? So that's what we call a, a deep network. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, neural network in a minute, but that's the basic idea behind neural network. Of course, there's much more. There is layers like convolutional layers. There is a recurrent neural network with RNN units and LSTM units. We won't go into that uh, for now, but that's the basic idea. Now, it's powerful, first of all, because it's nonlinear. And the really interesting and tough problem are usually modeling nonlinearity. And with the activation function that I mentioned uh, earlier, that is in each artificial neuron, we, we get the nonlinearity, which allows these uh, models to model nonlinear uh, problems. 
uh, it has hierarchical feature learning in the sense that um, every layer here is, feeds the next layer, which feeds the next layer, which feeds the next layer. Um, this allows for learning hierarchies of representations. And uh, I mean, one uh, intuition that is commonly used is you take uh, some kind of a vision problem, and every layer looks at different level of details in the input images. The first layer will just look at ed edges. So very quick changes, for fast changes from in grayscale values. The next layer will actually combine different edges into what we call corners. The next layer will combine corners into actually features in the image. Like if you're looking at a face detection problem, we look at you know different features of the nose, of the eyes, etc. And um, this uh, hierarchy in learning gives the neural network a lot of power because we can actually augment that hierarchy. We can very easily add layers. We can add units in each layer to model more complex problems. We can similarly reduce the complexity and the expression power of the network by reducing units, reducing layers. Um, so as I said, this is the scalable architecture of the neural network. And, and lastly, it's uh, very computationally intensive. Right? I spoke earlier about ResNet 152, uh, which is, uh, used to be, until recently, a state-of-the-art network for object uh, classification. Just one forward pass through ResNet 152, so taking an input of an image and getting all the way through the network until we get an output takes a, a, a few billion floating point operations. Just one pass. Now imagine if you have a, you know, a, a, a serious a production service serving maybe hundreds or thousands of requests per second. Uh, imagine the computational load on your back end, right? Um, so that's one you know, downside, potentially, of uh, deep learning. But with the um, amazing growth in the capabilities of GPUs, and also CPUs, but uh, you know, primarily GPUs, um, this, uh, this need is being addressed uh, rapidly. OK. By the way, feel free to raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, happy to, to answer through. We also reserve some time at the end of the talk for more questions. But if you want to ask a question in context, feel free. OK, now I want to talk to you about why deep learning is a big deal. Um, it has a growing impact on our lives already. Uh, if you look only in Amazon, personalization, logistics, voice, autonomous vehicles in Amazon, in the case it's drones, major aspects of how these things work already today is powered by deep learning. Um, and um, if you go look outside of Amazon, the revolution of self-driving cars is uh, enabled, uh, a lot of it is enabled through deep learning, and there's lots of other examples. So it's already impacting our lives. Uh, and lastly, there's another reason why it's a big deal, um, and it is how well it does compared to other alternatives. Um, I mentioned uh, object classification. Uh, has anyone here heard of ImageNet competition? OK. so. Not everyone is aware, but ImageNet competition is a competition that happens every year. I think they actually stopped it because the problem has effectively been solved. Um, and that problem is of object classification. Given an input image and a set of 1,000 uh, classes, identify the most prominent uh, object in that image out of the classes available, right? So in this case, we have an image of a cat lying on bed. Um, what is that object? For us humans, it's very easy, right? It's a cat. Um, it, this used to be a very hard problem in computer science and computer vision uh, until the deep learning revolution. Now that problem is considered to be solved. And this just shows, for this input, the, uh, an example of the output by an algorithm. And it says, you know, number one probability, tabby tabby cat, 57%. And then there's the others. Uh, interesting to look at number five, toilet seat, 1.66%. <laughs> Uh, but that's probably not state-of-the-art results anyway. So anyway, that, that's, that's uh, object classification. Now, I think what's interesting um, is that, first of all, uh, in 2012, uh, a deep learning-based uh, model from Alex Krichevsky, uh, University of Toronto, was able to beat the best algorithm to date by, I think, something like 30%, which was unheard of in terms of the improvements, because until that time, uh, improvements in that competition were, you know, in fraction of percentages. So that was a big thing. Since 2012, every year, the winner of that competition is based on neural networks. Uh, but beyond uh, deep learning beating the other machine learning and machine vision techniques, 
the other interesting aspect is how well deep learning does compared to us humans. So this is, uh, uh, I took this screenshot out of a research published uh, last year, which actually tried to measure that. So they compared um, neural networks for object classification. Actually, none of these. Uh, AlexNet, that's the one from 2012. GoogleNet is maybe 2014. VGG16, 2015. None of these is state of the art today, but it compared these networks to humans. As you can see here, red is humans, around 87% uh, accuracy. And look at these models. So point being, uh, deep learning is also doing better than humans and more and more tasks. So deep learning is a big deal. I hope you would agree with me now. Um, So the question is, uh, how did the comparison in the study work? Um, I'll give a b brief answer. Uh, they took a problem similar to object classification. They took a set of uh, images, let a set of humans look at it, and uh, provide their identification of the different classes, and fed the same images to different models, and then compared the results for accuracy. So similar problem to this. It wasn't the image net data set, though. It was a different set of images. Um, so now you agree with me, hopefully, that deep learning is a big deal. It does better than machine learning uh, techniques, uh, other machine learning techniques, and humans. And now we want to just go ahead and use it in production, right? OK, it's, it's good, because that's the whole purpose of this talk. How do we use it in production? Uh, so maybe we can start with the question, OK, so what does a deployed model look like? right? How does, you know, what does it mean to take a model and deploy it to production? Actually, it's not very different than taking a web application and deploying it in production. Uh, first of all, we have our model. And on the other end, we have a bunch of clients that want to be able to call that model for prediction or for inference. Um, this can be mobile, desktop, IoT, other cloud services. Deploying a model to production basically means having a system in place that, um, on one hand, um, encapsulates that model or accesses that model. And then on the other end, through the internet, exposes an endpoint that these clients can call. Right? That's very simply put. Oh, and, and maybe we want to have, you see this set of boxes, some kind of ability to scale out, right? If our production service gets more and more traffic, we want to scale out so we can um, still keep low latency, high throughput, and address all of the needs. So that's basically what, what it means when we say deploying a model to production. Uh, it's really an engineering problem. Um, what? So going into more details, uh, there's what we call the undifferentiated heavy lifting of model serving, right? And by the way, all of AWS is based on the idea of handling undifferentiated heavy lifting, uh, making developers not worry about you know, setting up instances or hosts, configuring them, patching them, um, configuring networks. All that stuff is undifferentiated heavy lifting. Uh, you as developers want to focus on the business value you're adding. Uh, AWS can solve a lot of the problem of you know, just uh, the setup for you, the infrastructure, etc. So model serving also includes a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting. It includes things like performance. We want to ensure the best performance. Uh, just like when you use a web server, you want that web server to give you the best performance in rendering your web application. With model serving, you'd want that server framework uh, to squeeze out the best performance possible uh, out of the boxes it runs on. Um, Availability, right? When you update your models, you want the system to maintain still high availability. You don't want users to experience system being down. You want the system to automatically use networking to expose HTTP endpoints, uh, to expose REST interfaces. Uh, you want to get monitoring so you know how your service is doing. Uh, you can get alerts or alarms when you know maybe latency thresholds are being uh, um, uh, going out of the range you're configuring. Uh, you want to know how many requests are coming in, how many requests are entering out, etc. cetera. Um, very importantly, you want to decouple your model from the actual serving infrastructure, right? We want the same server framework to be able to serve model for identifying cats in images or synthesizing speech or do other things. Uh, you don't want your model to be baked into your framework. You want it decoupled, just like any good software system. And lastly, you want it to support multiple frameworks because there's multiple frameworks out there, right? More than just TensorFlow or MXNet. And your data scientists 
uh, or engineers uh, might want to use different frameworks for different models. And you also want it cross-platform. Some services you might want to enable to run on GPUs because it's more performant, more cost-effective that way, while others you might want to run on CPUs. You want that server framework to handle all of that for you. You don't want to handle it yourself because you want to focus around your actual business uh, problem that you're solving. Um, I'm going to show you how model server for MXNet, which is an open source solution by AWS that my team contributes to, how it addresses all of that and more. Um, and again, at the end of this talk, I want you to be able within 10 to 15 minutes to actually take a model and just host it for inference yourselves. Um, so first, I'll talk to you about MXNet. Um, who here is familiar with MXNet? OK. Who is familiar with TensorFlow? <laughs> OK. Cool. So MXNet is very similar to TensorFlow. It's, a, it's an Apache open source project that allows you to build, train, and deploy uh, neural networks, um, DNNs, deep neural networks. It was created originally by the academia, so a collaboration between uh, students at uh, CMU and University of Washington. And AWS adopted it uh, at uh, sometime 2016 as the deep learning framework of choice. Now, AWS, it's very important to, to you know, clearly stress that. AWS supports whatever framework you, the developers, AWS users, want to use. And we make sure TensorFlow, Keras, MXNet, PyTorch, and other framework run super well on AWS. We actually optimize all of these frameworks to run very fast on AWS. But we support uh, MXNet because we believe it adds a lot of value for customers who choose to use it, right? Um, the main reason why AWS chose MXNet is because uh, it's immensely scalable, right? Which goes well with our notion at AWS of giving the users best bang for their buck uh, in terms of how much uh, performance you can squeeze out of your, the hardware you use, the infrastructure you use on AWS. Uh, so a bit more about the highlights of MXNet. Ease of use, it supports both imperative, uh, symbolic, and dynamic APIs across different languages like Python. We have a Scala API. We're going to introduce a Java API uh, soon. We have a C API. We have a C++. Um, most of these are actually contributed by the open source community. Um, Recently, the open source community contributed Closure API for MXNet, which was pretty cool. Uh, and there's a bunch of examples and tutorials for the APIs and for how to do training on one uh, machine, on multiple GPUs, etc. cetera. Um, performance is one of the highlights of MXNet. There's a lot of uh, research uh, or papers out there by different users uh, comparing uh, you know, different neural network frameworks like MXNet to Keras to, um, to TensorFlow. You'll see in most of them that uh, MXNet uh, performs better uh, in most cases. Um, so scalability and performance is one of the highlights of, of, of MXNet. And it also supports advanced features around performance like uh, quantization, uh, sparse, uh, and other things. And portability. Uh, with MXNet, you can train on the cloud and predict on edge. MXNet actually has versions of binaries that you can run on ARM CPUs. Um, uh, we have a model serving framework that I'm talking to you about now, and it has built-in Onyx support. Who here uh, heard about Onyx? OK. I'll talk more about Onyx later, but it's uh, an industry initiative that AWS is also involved in, together with Microsoft and Facebook and other companies, to provide an interchangeable format for neural networks that you can just use across different frameworks. So we'll talk more about that. Um, so that's MXNet. MXNet model server is a machine learning model server, addresses the needs I described earlier. It serves MXNet and Onyx models. Uh, it's based on MXNet as the underlying engine. It automates the HTTP endpoint setup for you. It auto-scales to all of the available CPUs and GPUs you have. It has pre-built and pre-configured containers you can just pull and run. Um, and it has a command line interface to package model artifacts for serving. I'll show you guys all of that in a bunch of demos. Uh, and also point you to resources you can use later to follow up uh, yourself. And lastly, it's an open source project under AWS Labs. You can follow that uh, URL, modelserver.io. You can contribute code. You can file issues. You can ask questions. Um, we're happy to, to work with you guys to make you successful with that. Um, OK. It's demo time. Um, 
I'll start with a, a quick demo of uh, using a model server. Um, so I pre-recorded this because you know demos, live demos never work. Yeah, we have a question. So the question is, if I choose framework A, maybe MXNet, what's the cost of me later migrating to another framework, framework B? Um, this, uh, it, it's a great question. It really depends on the actual model you're using and about things like whether the framework A supports something like Onyx. Uh, but based on my experience, I'm seeing many uh, practitioners, AWS customers using deep learning that have expertise and use multiple frameworks, and they move between these uh, frameworks. Although, having said that, taking a model in framework A and translating it to framework B is not always a trivial task, but it really depends on your model. If your model is simple enough and uses the basic building blocks that you know, are kind of mostly the same across frameworks, that would be easy. If you have complex models with, let's say, custom operators, custom layers, it's going to be a bit more investment to migrate. Okay, you feel free to drop by later on. We can talk more about that. Okay, on to the demo. So we'll show you how to basically start using uh, the model server. Now installing it is very easy. You just do a pip install, MXNet model server. That's it. We use PyPy, uh, Python's uh, packaging management tool, to pull in all of the dependencies and install model server. And that's it. You're done. Now if we do a pip show, uh, MXNet model server, we can see that it's installed. And we can see this is version 0.15. It's a bit old version. The latest version is 0.4. 1.0 is coming really soon. But for the sake of the demo, nothing changes. It's still the same functionality uh, in terms of how you use it. Um, now, now that we have it installed, let's look at the CLI, the command line interface. So if we do MXNet model server dash H, we can see the different uh, parameters we can use. And there's really a bunch of them. I won't go over each and every one. There's not enough time. Um, but really the important one is the dash dash models, which is this guy, which allows us to specify key value pair for the different models we want to deploy. Now we can deploy multiple models in the same server instance. We give each model a key name, and then the value is a model archive. That's a package that encapsulates everything we need to run our model. We'll look into that in more details. Now, if you want to just use uh, models to try it out, uh, we actually have what we call a model zoo on the GitHub repository. So if you go to AWS Labs, MXNet model server, um, there's nice documentation explaining everything I'm just talking to you about now, but in, probably in, in much more details. Um, but one of the things you have there under the docs folder is also a model zoo markdown file, which contains a bunch of different models you can just go ahead and use. Um, since I took this screencast, that list is actually grown. There's pretty cool models there. But in this example, we'll start with a very simple model for image classification called SqueezeNet. Um, I'm using it for the demo because it's only five megs in size. It was designed for mobile devices where you might not have a lot of um, space on the device. You want to keep it small. And the models, you have a complete example of how to, how to use it, and we'll just uh, do it now. So we'll start by just copying the URL to the model archive, that dot .model file. That's just the URL on S3 where that file resides. And to host and serve our model, we very simply do MXNet model server, dash dash models, SqueezeNet is the key name we're choosing, and then the URL. Hit enter, and that's it. MMS will fetch that model, unpack it locally, and configure the endpoints, configure the model, configure MXNet, and everything is ready for us to actually serve the model. You can see running on localhost port 8080, which is the default host and port. And now let's uh, do a curl command, just to make sure our server is running. So curl localhost port 8080 slash ping, that's an endpoint for pinging, and we can see we got the JSON response, health, healthy, cool. Now let's actually try to do a prediction. So this is an image classification model. It expects images as input. Um, We'll do a curl command to download an image of, uh, guess what, a cat, right? <laughs> um, we're following the tradition of all the examples in deep learning involving cats and dogs. So we just download the image. We can open it just to make sure it's indeed an image of a cat. And yep, 
it is an image of a cat. Um, and now we want to do predictions. So again, we can use curl. Now what's nice about model server, it also handles the um, data translation for you. So you know, neural networks, they don't handle JPEG images. They handle tensors, right, which is multi-dimensional arrays. Um, but we can, uh, in the request, we can actually provide a JPEG image to model server and it will convert it automatically into a tensor. So we do curl dash x post, squeeze net slash predict, and then we just attach the um, image to the request. We do data equals at kitten.jpg, and curl will make sure to include that. And voila, it was pretty fast, but we got a prediction result, and we can see that 85% probability that this is an Egyptian cat. I don't know what an Egyptian cat means, but I trust the uh, model, right? It says it's better than human, so. <laughs> All right, so that was the demo. That's it. I hope you, you see how easy it is to run and to host models. Um, there's a bit more complexity than that, but are there any questions so far? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? So what would you do then, how would you then take this and put it into product? How would you then take this exact model exactly and then put it into production? What's your recommendation? Yeah, that's, that's, a great, that's a great question. So, so far, all of this demo was actually running, I, when I took the screencast, I actually ran it on my Mac. You can take exactly the same steps and run it on an EC2 instance. Actually, it's already available for you on uh, AWS's DL AMI, the deep learning AMI, and it will work. That can be your server. However, for production use cases where you expect the scale of you know, tens or hundreds of requests per second, uh, we recommend to use containers. And we actually have a pre-built, pre-configured container images for you, you can use. We'll go over that in a minute, okay? All right, let's go back to our presentation. Uh, okay. So uh, I'll go over a few aspects of how you use the model server. The first one is the model archive. Model archive is actually a key part because if you remember, when we started model server, we gave it a key value pair. The key was just a key name for the model. The value was a URL. It can also be a local file system path for the model. Uh, and that was pointing at the model archive. But what does this model archive actually mean? So we'll go over that in a minute. So first of all, it's a package, a single file that encapsulates a few things. One way to think about it, similar to a Java jar, right? The jar is a Java archive. It contains a bunch of things that Java needs in order to run your program. So similarly, a model archive, we can maybe call it MR, but I don't know, uh, contains that everything the model server needs to run our model. So first and foremost, it contains a train network, right? And there's a bunch of layers, uh, the parameters, the weights, right, that are associated with each artificial neuron in that layer. It's all part of the network. Beyond that, it contains what we call a model signature. Model signature is simply a JSON file telling model server what's our expected input of the model and expected output. So model server can set up the HTTP endpoints, request handlers, and response handler appropriately. It contains potentially, you don't have to add it, but if you want to, you can add custom code. And what we've, we've learned internally in Amazon, and also speaking to AWS customers, real world production models always need some kind of pre-processing and post-processing code. There's always some image normalization to do, uh, request validation to do, there's different things you want to do, and we give you the ability to do that just by providing Python code. We'll go over that in a minute. And also you can include whatever other auxiliary assets, meaning auxiliary files, you may want. Um, we don't, uh, model server doesn't hold you back. You can put whatever you want there. Usually you would put their assets that your custom code needs at runtime. We'll, we'll show an example to that. Once you have all of these, you just use the model export CLI, so that's a command line interface of model server, to package everything up into a model archive. Now I'll tell you a small secret. This model archive is nothing but a zip file. Okay, by the way, Java jar, the Java archive is exactly the same, it's a zip file. It's a zip file containing all of these assets plus some uh, manifest that is automatically generated by model server, so model server knows how to parse the archive, like you know, versioning and other information, and that's it. Let's see how, um, how this looks, um, how is the, the model archive. Okay. So 
This shows the directory of SqueezeNet, and you can see the different uh, assets there, and we'll go over one by one. So first one is SqueezeNet, v1.1 symbol.json. That's MXNet's uh, definition of the neural networks. Um, we don't need to dive into the details here, but it's just a simple JSON file saying, okay, what are the different layers in my network? What are the uh, attributes of every layer? You can see an activation function of type prelude, and there's all of that. You get that automatically when you save an MXNet model you trained into file, okay? Uh, next, we have the, um, the signature that I mentioned earlier. So it's very simple, just a JSON file saying, okay, these are my inputs. My input node name is data. It expects an image of size 224 by 224. My output is a softmax. And, oh, this room is fast. <laughs> uh, let me quickly go back. So my input data shape is 03224 by 224. It's just a RGB representation of a 224 by 224 image. That's the tensor my network expects. But we also tell the model server, hey, expect an input type of JPEG. With that, model server knows that incoming request should have a JPEG, a MIME type as an attachment, and convert that into the tensor to feed into the network, right? Um, and then the output, the output node name is softmax. It will have a shape of um, 0, 1,000, because there's 1,000 classes in ImageNet, right? 1,000 different classes. And the output type to return over the wire is JSON, okay? That's how, with this simple JSON file, we actually explain to the model server what kind of input to ex endpoint to expose and how to do the basic pre-processing and uh, request handling and response handling for that model. Uh, next, let's open an auxiliary file called synset.txt. This is an auxiliary file we add, which basically contains all of the ImageNet classes, that 1,000 classes that the algorithm identifies objects based on. And you can see, for example, tabby tabby cat. And most importantly, probably our custom code. Okay, so this is the custom code we're providing for this service. I'll uh, explain this just in a bit details. So. Uh, you can see uh, it's a Python code. The class MXNet Vision Service extends MXNet Base Service. And um, with the custom code, we need to extend the, the base service and we need to override a few uh, class methods um, if we want to do some things. Like if we want to do preprocessing, we'll override the preprocess method. And we can see in this example, this code of the preprocess basically takes the, the image. Uh, reads it, resizes it, transforms the shape into what the uh, model expects. Um, we have the preprocess method, which basically um, does a top probability, meaning the, the, our model returns the probability for each one of these 1,000 classes, but our users don't really need 1,000 classes, right? They maybe want the top, what we call top K, so top five in this case. So this uh, basically one line of code basically takes sorts the response attaches the names of the labels from the synset file we've seen earlier, and it turns that to the user over the HTTP response. That makes sense? I have a question. Yeah. So with images, is that processed in the image vectors right away, or the image is stored locally and then processed into vectors and used as input? Yeah. For performance reasons, it doesn't make sense to store the image, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. So the question is, does model server stores the incoming image to file before it processes it? Um, no, so model server handles that for you. Um, in the pre-process, you have the data argument. That includes all of the incoming parameters within the request. It, you can, in your custom code, save it to file if you want. You, you should have a good reason to do it because it will kill your performance. So it's all in memory. By default, it's all in memory. Okay, that's a good question. Um, by the way, we've encountered the issue with the software stack we're using here where one of the layers we're using was actually storing uh, files from a given size into file and we've actually optimized that away. So that's a very relevant question. Okay, and uh, basically uh, that's it. Now we have all these files. What we do next 
What we do next is we want to use the export utility. So we do MXNet model export, model name, we give it the name SN for SqueezeNet, model path dot because it's a local file system, and that's it. Model server will create a dot model file for us. You can see it here. It's around uh, 50 megs. Most of it is just the parameters of the uh, network because that's, that's what's really heavy about neural networks is the parameters. You can see 49.4 MB, sorry, 4.9 MB is the SqueezeNet v11 params, right? That's the binary parameters using the network. And our model archive in total is uh, 5.01 MB. So most of it is just the, the parameters. But of course, in terms of logic, everything else is super important. And we have a model archive. Um, and we can uh, serve that very easily like we've seen earlier. MXNet model server, dash dash models, SN equals SN.model. We're providing here a local file system path, if you can see, and not a URL because we have it locally. And model server will just load that model locally, put it into memory, bind it, create the endpoints, and serve it. We don't need to do the demo again, I think. Um, cool. Any questions, guys? All right. I told you it's going to be simple, right? Um, moving to other things. Um, so REST and Open API. I'll just skim through this. Model server basically exposed a REST-like endpoint. Uh, for every model loaded, you have the model name you provide when you start model server slash predict. That's the endpoint for making requests, and it expects a post request. Um, these endpoints are auto-generated from the signature file. Uh, by default, it uses JSON encoding, but you can use other encodings like uh, JPEG, as I've seen earlier. And actually, with custom code, you can handle whatever you know, encoding you choose to use. We have some examples of model server on the model server website that use uh, Base64 encoding for inputs and outputs uh, for face detection. So you can use whatever you want. Um, and we also support open API. So uh, if you, you know, in these examples, I was using curl uh, for making the request. But you know, in a real software system, you want to use curl, you will use you know, whatever Java or Python or C++ uh, to make the request. Uh, but you can actually auto-gen uh, client code uh, through the open API support. Um, I skip demoing it. Uh, let's just move on to containerization because I think that's super interesting. It was also raised before. So actually for production use cases, um, or let's start actually by a different angle. For prototyping use cases, I would recommend to do just the demo I showed. Just install it locally on your Linux box, your Mac, or your Windows. Use it. Um, play around with it. Make sure it's working as expected. But for production, when you have you know, high-scale service you want to handle, uh, we recommend to use containers. Is, uh, who's familiar with containers? Okay, yeah. So containers is a well-known technology, kind of took the world by storm. Um, and um, it provides, um, it provides a, um, an image that you can then deploy on different uh, hosts with exactly the same software configuration. Um, it has good support by production-ready orchestration tools like Amazon ECS, the Elastic Container Service, Docker, of course, uh, Google's Kubernetes. Um, all of them are, really provide uh, great support for uh, container orchestration. Uh, on the model server side, we just want you guys to be able to leverage these tools. We don't try to reinvent these tools. We do this by, no, actually, some other why containers is good, some other points. Very easy to scale out with containers, right? You need to add more capacity. In the model server use case, you can just throw in more containers behind your load balancer, and you'll get more capacity. Um, um, we offer robust and scalable images. Uh, these images, container images, automatically leverage all GPUs and CPUs on the host. So if, for example, um, um, you have uh, you know, an AWS uh, C5, I don't know, uh, eight extra large image, which has, I don't remember how many, maybe 16 CPUs or 32 CPUs. Um, the model server container will automatically use all of these CPUs for you. If you're using a P3 instance with multiple GPUs, the container image will automatically leverage all these GPUs for you. You don't need to do anything. Um, and these images are available now on Docker Hub. So if you go to on Docker Hub to AWS Deep Learning Team slash MMS CPU or MMS GPU, you can just download these images. Um, 
what's happening when using the container image, so, um, and I'll show you a demo in a minute, but you have the Docker image, you either do a Docker pull from uh, Docker Hub, or you do a build if you want. The, the Docker image file is actually within the model server repository. And after that, you do a Docker run. And this is what you get. You get a, on your favorite orchestration tool of choice, ECS or Docker or other, you have your container cluster. You need to set up a load balancer. But behind that, you have a bunch of MMS containers. Each one of them comes pre-configured with M uh, MXNet, with NGINX as a reverse proxy, and with the model server on top of that, um, which is it's a very easy way to get started. But uh, it's also very robust. By having NGINX as a reverse proxy, you get all the benefits of a reverse proxy, like isolation from slow clients, like very uh, um, robust and useful uh, production features for setting up uh, you know, certificates or for limiting the request queue. There, there's a bunch of these things supported by Nginx. And of course, behind that, you have the model server connected, handling the requests. Yeah. OK, it's a good question. So the question is, for the models, uh, do we um, share them by some kind of a remote uh, storage, or do we uh, have them uh, available locally? You can do both. Uh, but at the end of the day, for a model server to load a model, it has to be local. So when you start model server, either through container or command line, you need to give it some kind of either a URL or a file system path for the model. If it's a URL, model server will go ahead and download that model to locally. So if you have, let's say, five container images, each one of them will download that model locally. And locally, it will unpack it, load it into memory, and start serving it. Um, you can also, we've seen customers basically fetching models themselves locally because they have some special pipeline requirements. In that case, model server will not fetch it. Of course, it will just unpack it locally and use it. Yeah. So, yeah. So the question is, okay, we every model goes through augmentation and updates every once in a while. How do we make sure all the model server are in sync? The recommended uh, process is to have a uh, one bucket for the model, and you just override that bucket when you have new version of the model, and you restart the server to fetch the updated model from the bucket. Now. I'll give you a spoiler. In uh, MMS version 1.0, you'll have a control plane API. Uh, you can just call that API and tell it, hey, please reload my model. And without taking model server down, you just go ahead and update it. So stay tuned. Uh, model, uh, by the way, model server version 1.0 is going to be amazing. Performance is going to be an order of magnitude faster, and you'll get control plane API. Um, and it, you, you will also have uh, support for more frameworks. But um, it's not released yet, so yeah, we won't talk too much about it. Um, okay, let's do a quick demo. Um, if you thought that using um, model server through a command line was simple, then you'll be surprised to see that with containers, it's even simpler. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start by... Um, I think we're wrong demo. Okay. Okay, let's start by actually going to Docker Hub. I mentioned earlier we have pre configured Docker images. They're available uh, as a Docker image file in the repository, but also they're available as built images on Docker Hub. You have the uh, link there. Um, you have a nice a readme description telling how to explaining how to use it, what's the configuration options, etc. With a quick start and all that stuff, you can go over it uh, later. Um, but let's see how we how we use that image specifically in this case on CPU. So we do a Docker pool, which pulls down the Docker image for us locally. And then if we do Docker images, we can see uh, that image available there, right? And um, Oh, this goes fast. Hold on. <laughs> um, and then what I did here, the command here, I just did a very simple uh, Docker run command. 
uh, dash, now just going quickly over the parameters. Dash ITD means it starts it in interactive detached mode. So it runs in the, in the background detached for us. Um, the name I'm giving this uh, Docker image is MMS for MXNet Model Server. Port binding, I'm binding port 80 on my local host, on my host uh, to port 8080 in the container, which is the default port Model Server is listening on. So requests coming into port 80 on my host will be tunneled to 8080. Um, the, the name of the uh, image is MMS CPU. And then I give it command line argument, MXNet Model Server, which is a command line available on that container image. Start is the command to start. And dash dash MMS config with a path to a configuration file. Now this configuration file is available for you by default with default parameters. Think of it as the repl <coughs> sorry, replacement to the CLI arguments when you run it locally, okay? And you can see that this uh, command returned and we have this model running. Um, and that's it. Now we have model server running locally inside the container. Uh, so if we do docker stats, we can see uh, this, uh, uh, this model running, MMS. Um, you can see it's consuming single digit CPU percentage, which is fine. And now let's do the curl command. So if we do a curl, again, like before, localhost, in this case, we don't need to specify the port because 80 is listening by default. Slash ping, we got a healthy response, so it's running. And again, we can get an image if we do a curl dash O. Um, we'll take an input image. I think it's still a cat image. It's downloaded, and now we can just do the curl request uh, locally and for the server to process. Curl dash X post localhost. By default, it's port 80 squeeze net slash predict with the image. And boom, we got the, the response back. See the prediction response. Again, Egyptian cat, 85% probability, okay? So that's it, that's the, that's the demo uh, for using it. Of course, at the end of the day, we need to do a Docker RM to uh, remove that image, and we're good to go. Any questions on the container use case? Okay. Um, We'll breeze through operational metrics. Uh, one key thing, if you ever own the production service, you always want to keep your tabs on your service at any given point in time, how well it's doing, how many requests it's getting, how many of them are failing, what's the latency, all that stuff. With the model server, that's taken care of for you with a built-in integration with uh, Amazon CloudWatch. So the metrics uh, you're getting are covering requests, latencies, resource utilization across different dimensions, like the model name, because you may have multiple models on the same host, but also host name, because your cluster will probably contain multiple hosts uh, on the cluster, and you might want to be able to you know, slice and dice your metrics based on different dimensions. Um, MMS, out, the model server out of the box, supports both uh, log file metrics that you can then attach to your own log processing program running on the host, or it can dump it into a CSV, which is very useful if you do like performance benchmarking. Well, but also, it has built-in integration with AWS CloudWatch through uh, AWS's BOTO uh, SDK. And uh, with just one command line flag or configuration flag, you can automatically get all the metrics from your cluster into CloudWatch. This is just an example. We're in at some point, you can see the different metrics you get, like resource utilization for CPU utilization, disk, memory, uh, incoming prediction request count, uh, inference latency, pre-process latency, and you get more metrics than that. All built in for you. With model server version 1.0, you also get the ability to report custom metrics. If you have special metrics you want to report, you'll get a Python API you can use through your custom code to report this as well, and they'll be tunneled just the same to all of the outputs. Any questions on metrics? Okay, and Onyx support. So um, I've explained what Onyx is briefly. I'll explain it again. Uh, I'll explain actually the problem Onyx is trying to solve. Uh, deep learning moves very rapidly, uh, and like every emerging technology or technology that is uh, kind of relatively early on with industry adoption, 
there's really a lot of options to choose from, right? Lots of different frameworks, like MXNet, Cafe, PyTorch, TensorFlow. Lots of runtime frameworks, like Core ML for Apple, TensorRT from NVIDIA, NGRAPH from Intel. How can we use all of that effectively, right? Um, if we want to have every framework support every platform, we get order of n to the power of two pairs. That's not sustainable. That's exactly what Onyx is trying to solve. It's a common IR, and IR stands for Intermediate Representation for Neural Networks, which means basically you can take a framework like PyTorch, which supports Onyx. You can export your PyTorch model into Onyx, and then you can take that uh, Onyx model and load it in a framework like MXNet that supports Onyx and then it will just work the same. Um, Onyx is supported in MXNet and also in the model server. So you can take your Onyx models exported from PyTorch or Chainer or I don't know what. You can package it up into a model archive with MXNet and uh, model server and the model server will serve it, uh, which basically allows the model server to support more than just one framework, more than just MXNet, right? Um, Onyx is, uh, yes. So this is just uh, execution time, not, uh, you can't really modify the framework. Um, it only supports execution of the models? Yes. Uh, so typically with deep learning and machine learning in general, we have two main phases. One phase is building and training our model. The other phase is actually using it uh, for, you know, your actual use case, uh, which is typically called inference. Model server is a tool is used for the latter. It's used for inference. It's not used for training in any way. The assumption is when you start using model server, you have a trained model you want to use in production. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I think you did, but just to completely clarify, so if you really wanted to then continue your development in MXNet, it was machine PyTorch, you pretty much have to rewrite it. Oh, okay. So this specific, I'll just repeat the question for everyone. So with regards to Onyx specifically, if I've built and trained my model with, let's say, PyTorch, exported it to Onyx, use it on MXNet, and I want to go back and retrain my model with more data, or maybe augment the network, can I do it? You can actually still do it with MXNet if you wish to, because um, Onyx preserves all of the layers, including layers like you know, Dropout, for example, is a layer which uh, is not used for inference. It's used only for training. Batch norm is a layer that uh, is used for, for training. So Onyx actually preserves even all of these, so you can actually reuse it in MXNet. The question is, do you want to? If typically, if you've used, you know, let's say PyTorch for building your model and training it, you'll have all your setup for training with PyTorch. Sometimes there's less benefit in moving to MXNet. Uh, I have seen customers doing it, and that primarily, if they want to reap the benefits of MXNet's performance and scalability, they will uh, continue training in MXNet but mostly people will prefer to continue training on the framework they started with. Right. Cool. Um, just one a note about Onyx. Onyx uh, is a, a really a wide industry initiative that is driven by AWS, Facebook, and Microsoft. Um, and uh, there's a growing community around it. I highly recommend check it out. It's on Onyx. If you go to uh, the internet, onyx.ai, there's lots of details. Again, it's an open source GitHub project. You can you're welcome to contribute. Uh, personally, I think it's an amazing initiative that just makes everyone's life easier. Um, okay. Um, next, we'll talk about using model server with AWS Fargate. Who here is familiar with Fargate? Okay. So uh, Fargate um, allows us to do what we call serverless model serving, right, where you don't need to have actual EC2 instances behind your server. Of course, they are available somewhere handling the request, but you as the user don't have to manually configure these instances. Um, Fargate is an AWS technology that allows you to deploy containers without managing hosts or clusters. If you ever used ECS or Docker, you know that you know, as part of your configuration, you also attach hosts, either physical or virtual hosts, to host your containers. With Fargate, you don't need to do that. The only thing you need to specify is the number of instances, sorry, the number of virtual CPUs and the memory, and Fargate will handle everything under the hood for you. Um, it allows seamless scaling. You pay only for the CPU and memory you've consumed, so it's also a very cost-efficient option. Uh, and you can use it with a model server. Now, here's the architecture at the high level, uh, how this looks. Um, first of all, you need to have your VPC. 
Inside your VPC, you set up your ECS cluster and service. And within that, you define multiple Fargate tasks. Basically, you define the task for every model you want to serve, uh, or set of models. And within these tasks, you configure them to use the MMS container image I've shown you earlier, which each one internally uh, contains model server, NGINX, uh, and the MXNet framework. Um, you attach these to a load balancer, which sits in front of your, uh, of your uh, cluster uh, and exposes an endpoint in the internet. And optionally, you can also configure CloudWatch integration, which will just work seamlessly to get your metrics out of the system. Um, and that's it. You can do all of that through the uh, Amazon ECS uh, web dashboard or through the uh, CLI. I won't go over uh, these steps in specific just because there's a lot of uh, manual steps involved. Uh, but the, the diagram I showed earlier, uh, and by the way, this whole deck will be uh, available for you guys, uh, kind of shows how uh, this setup, uh, what's the architecture of the setup. And on the model server GitHub repository, you have a step-by-step -step definition of how to configure model server with Fargate, which I encourage you guys to check out. Okay? Um, yeah? Is Fargate a display orchestration, container orchestration? Yes. So the question is, is Fargate a container orchestration framework? Uh, the answer is yes. Fargate is actually part of Amazon ECS. ECS is Amazon's container orchestration framework. It stands for Elastic Container Service. Fargate is a, a way to use ECS, which is serverless, right? Where you don't have to attach um, EC2 instances. So it simplifies the workflow. And it has other benefits, like I mentioned, like uh, seamless scaling, and also you, you pay for what you use. So as far as I know, Kubern it's uh, somewhat similar to Kubernetes. The question is, is Fargate similar to Kubernetes? Um, Kubernetes is a framework. It's not, it's orchestration framework. It's not a managed service like ECS. So with Kubernetes, uh, it gives you great tools, but you need to manually deploy and run these tools somewhere. Um, actually, ECS recently launched a, a Kubernetes managed service, which gives you that capability on AWS. But Kubernetes, as far as I know, is not serverless. So if you want a serverless capability, you want to abstract away the need to manage EC2 instances, Fargate is a great way to go. OK. Any other question? Yeah. ECS itself is a fully managed service? Yes. Elastic Kubernetes service. It's also part of the overall Amazon ECS, but it's one that specifically uses a flavor of Kubernetes under the hood. Are uh, you referring specifically to the model server? And all these ways to combine Yeah, so specifically, you know, with, with containers, I mean, first of all, you are right. There's always a lot of different ways to do different things. Um, and it also depends on your actual use case. With uh, containers, there's definitely tons of ways to go. Containers are very popular. There's a lot of good resources on the AWS website uh, under ECS, which I encourage you to go check out. Specifically with the model server, because it's a more narrow domain, if you go to the model server GitHub repository, uh, you can just go to modelserver.io and then it will take you there. There's a specific documentation around setting up uh, scalable inference with containers that gives you a step-by-step -step recipe on how to set this up. And that would be the way I would recommend you to go, um, assuming your needs are kind of generic. If your needs are more specific, I mean, I'm happy to chat and see how we can help out. Okay, how much time do we have left? We're over. Oh, is it over? oh I'm over. <laughs> okay, so I'm over. Um, I wanted to do another end-to-end -end demo with facial expression recognition, which is a really cool deep learning application, identifying emotions in images. Um, you'll have this, there is the link below, github.com slash talkai facial emotion recognition. It's a talk um, I gave at a meetup earlier. There is a nice Jupyter notebook that shows you how to both build a model training and deploying it with MMS for emotion recognition. Super cool application of deep learning, the detecting emotions in images. Lots of potential interesting Big Brother applications, but we're, uh, <laughs> um, but it's it's a cool one. Um, and lastly, if you want to learn more about using MXNet on AWS, we actually have expert in Amazon AI that can review your deep learning use case 
help you out, consult. Um, there is an email here, MB Bossy, feel free to take a picture uh, or chat with me later. We want to hear from you. Um, we want to help you guys use AWS for deep learning, use MXNet, um, and we go at great length with different customers to help, <coughs> to help out. Um, someone still wants to take a picture? Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, beyond that, I really enjoyed the talk. I hope uh, I, uh, you know, uh, withheld my or held my, my promise of enabling you guys to deploy models in, you know, 15 minutes to production. And if I haven't, come talk to me. I'm happy to see how, how we can help. There's lots of great resources on modelserver.io and the mxnet.io website that I encourage you to go and check out. Um, and we're always listening on, you know, GitHub issues. Uh, if you file issues with your questions, with feature requests, with bugs, we're following up pretty quickly. Okay. Um, I think I need to wrap up because I'm out of time. I'll be available if you want to ask me more questions. Um, I should probably wrap up, right? Yeah, okay. Thank you.